Shepherd of my soul, I beg thee to tell where thou keepest thy sheep to rest. For why should I roam in the valley of tears and wander as one? Shepherd of my soul, I beg thee to tell where thou keepest thy sheep to rest. For why should I roam in the valley of tears and wander as one? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to you. I want you more than gold and silver. Only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver. Is that? 
desire and I long to worship you. You're my friend and you are my father even though you are my king. I love you more than any other so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone will my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship. the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship here I am to bow to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all kings, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became born. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. All together lovely, all together worthy, all together to me. Right. May the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, amen. <laughs> I'm just as anxious today as I was yesterday. Um, if this doesn't make sense today, just, just nod and pretend it does. Um, <laughs> give me some moral support. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, yesterday we talked about the weakness part. Um, that us being limited beings, right? We're gonna always we're gonna always have problems in the sense that we're not um, we're not able to always function. Not always. We usually do not function perfectly. I've never functioned perfectly, but um, but that there's this importance of how like human um, agency is used, how human will is used. Right, um, and so we were looking at the the verse of um, Saint Paul 
talking about his um, weakness and the Lord telling him that his, that his grace is sufficient and his uh, might is shown forth through this. Anyway, we talked about the different ways that a person can become weak or incapacitated and that there's a, there's a difference between the two, right? Is that weakness can come as a result of, either of them can come as a result of, of choice or non-choice. But one of the reasons why I wanted to differentiate is that because God's grace doesn't pertain only to the things that I have control over, right? Like it, it, it does have to do with both. So it's really hard to talk about God's grace um, in, a, in, a, in a dogmatic way because we don't have any control over God's grace. Um, and it's also hard because everything is, is grace. Um, and yet at the same time, it's this, this, this weird position we find ourselves in where you gotta do stuff, but God is always doing stuff too. Um, and this is an area that I think is overly done in our fights, our historical fights with the Protestants um, about what grace is and, and, and how it works um, and whether it's all grace, sola gratia, um, or not. And I don't think anyone would disagree with Luther, like it is all grace, that just doesn't take away from human agency. Right, like the, the two don't cancel each other out. We'll get into that. This is, meant to, this is not meant to be a dogmatic talk, but um, I'm going to ignore my notes for a second um, and come back to it because my, my notes are not in a, in a good order. I like stories, so I'm going to just use Desert Fathers to talk about grace um, with ways that they talked about grace, about how you can get it, how you can lose it, um, and stuff like that. But if, if maybe as a framing analogy, because um, I was trying to think about grace... Um, early on, beginning of, of priesthood, and my nephew, my oldest nephew, was very young at the time. So if, so I mean, this would be a better analogy if it was dad, but I was an uncle, so I'm the uncle, but God is the uncle in the analogy. Um, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I, see, I saw my nephew at the time, he still is very cute, um, but I was like, my, uncle, my nephew is probably very ugly to other people, um, but because he's my nephew. <laughs> he was very cute um, and all that the uncle has towards the nephew okay we'll just use parents all that the parents have towards their kid um, <laughs> is love right like they just like their kid right there's the, the kid didn't do anything right to be loved the kid just got born right the kid didn't even make himself right he's just there right and the parents see the kid in a way that others don't see the kid right, no matter what the kid is doing, right? Now, as the kid grows and develops cognitively, right, and, and has a will of his own, right, suddenly, so the parents have been nurturing the kid, feeding the kid, right, playing with the kid, doing all sorts of the kid, all of that are different forms of grace, just giving free stuff, okay? But as the kid grows, and can make decisions, the context of the kind of decisions he makes does affect grace, okay? It doesn't affect the parent's willingness to give grace, right? It's that the disposition of the person who's in the place of receiving, that's the person that can affect how a person does or doesn't receive grace, right? So it's not about, in, in other words, to me, grace is a fountain to borrow like, um, Protestant songs, it is a fountain ever flowing, but I can actively stop it, right? I can shove stuff into the holes where the water's coming out, being like, I don't want it, right? There's never an unwillingness from the other side to shower forth. It's all about my disposition towards grace, and that's why, why yesterday mattered, right? Yesterday mattered because we're often complaining about not getting God's grace, and where is God's help, and where is blah, blah, and often... The issue is me, right? The issue is in factually never God, um, but, but we might not realize what we are doing that robs us of grace, we're robbing ourselves of grace, um, or makes me cold towards grace where I can hate grace. Um, all of those things can become possible. And so if you think about it, um, to receive grace, I'm gonna speak generally and then we'll get into the stories, I have to be present to it, 
right? I have to be present in a relationship to receive, right? Imagine if I, if I want my rich dad, like to use the, the analogy to be like, I don't like you and I have nothing to do with you. Um, and um, wherever I am, just send me money, right? Like there's, there's, doesn't really work, right? Or imagine, even think about any of your, your own relationships, right? Of being like, you should be visiting me every single day. And it's like, I live in wherever, right? But not just in terms of physical presence, but I mean present in the relationship, right? Just being a part of the relationship, right? Is that how many of you would feel that somebody rightfully can demand of you certain behaviors when you don't even have a relationship, right? Like, I can't be like, I'm a Buddhist, how dare you not be there for me when I was sad? I'm like, who are you, <laughs> right? Like, in Tamim, like, I mean, he wouldn't say that, he's really nice. But my point is that I can't demand that of him, right? That's, that's not a thing, right? So presence is monumentally important for receiving grace. And again, that's part of the, the, the side of things where my will matters. That's why, again, why yesterday mattered. What am I choosing to love? What am I loving, right? And if I'm not in that presence, it's not going to work. There can also be a non-active refusal of grace by simply removing myself from that place, right? Where let's say the kid decides to move away from home, right? That, that might not be wrong, but if he is chosen to be away, there might be certain things he's not getting by mere virtue of not being home, right? The laundry is not being done for him, right? That, that, that's all parents are for, right? There might not be allowance, the food's not on the table. Suddenly, that grace, the free stuff that he was getting, right, isn't there just by not physically being there, right? And by that I mean that if you are actively or non-actively just simply away from the sacraments, you're removed from grace, not because grace hates you, right? Not because God doesn't want to give it to you, you elected not to be present to grace, right? Um, and I'm saying you're even non-maliciously, right? Like it doesn't have to always be malicious, but you can also maliciously do that. Um, and that's why a relationship of trust is necessary, right? Because let's say um, your kid says, hey, I want to be a, a doctor because every good Coptic kid needs to be a doctor. Um, and so the parents are like, okay, we want to help you do that, right? And it's like, but you're bombing school. I'm ready to pay for a tutor, right? And you're like, I don't want a tutor, right? Or I don't want to study, right? Then it's just like, okay, they're giving you grace. They're giving you free stuff and you're refusing, right? Or you can be like, I hate you so much. I don't want your money. I'm not going to take a tutor because I don't like you, right? And so suddenly you're refusing grace. Right? And it's your disposition that's caused you to not have that benefit. And then later on, you might say, woe is me. Right? My point is that relationship in terms of grace is monumentally important. Right? That you have a very important role in grace. I think what we want is to be able to walk around um, and just constantly get free stuff. And the thing is that he's also doing that because the world and everything in it is a grace. Right? Like the fact that you exist is a grace. The fact that all of this is here is a grace. And so, but you can have this added grace, right? Grace upon grace by your choice of how to be in relationship with somebody, right? Um, and so that's why the trust between one another matters, right? That if I don't have a trust towards my dad, I might not be willing to take from his hand or I'll be suspicious about what I take from his hand. Right? And then I might have a wrong view of him and everything that relates from it and then the consequences of it because I'm viewing it through a wrong lens. That's a talk about purity. That's a different thing. Right? But my point is that our disposition matters so much in grace. So I'm going to go through random stories to talk about it and then hopefully someone can tie the things together because I think it's all over the place. But your mental disposition, let's start with, with that. In order to receive grace... You can't love evil, right? Like the, the two can't go hand in hand. 
against the change of the evil will of those men who deny the grace which is born towards them. This is the start of this, this story. This is the title of the story. Against the change of the evil will of, the, of those men who deny the grace which is performed. One of the teachers said, if you have made yourself humble, they despise you without discernment. If you've made yourself angry, they won't, they hate you without understanding. If you make yourself pleasant, you will be swallowed and disappear. If you make yourself bitter or cruel, they reject you and you are reviled. And if you have mingled with folk, they hold you to be a liar. If, if they have fallen ill, they command you, and if they are despised, they judge you. If they be visited, they abuse you, and if you are whole, they leave you, and if they are reclining, they drive you away. And, and if aught be required from them, they curse you, and if mercy be shown unto them, they oppress you. Neither grace or goodness nor justice will ever please those who belong to every evil of every kind. What are we saying here? People who just hate everything will never like grace, right? And that's something I don't think we think about, and I think that we should because we're a very negative society, right? That if you walk around with a, a mind that prefers evil, you won't like grace, right? You won't like it. It'll taste bad to you, right? When you want something wrong, you're not going to like the hand of grace, right? If you want to be reckless and you don't want an education, when your parents are saying, but Habibi, I'll pay for your education, and you're like, I don't care. I don't want an education, right? If you don't like goodness, you prefer evil, then the idea of getting a free education is useless to you, right? It becomes something contemptible, right? You won't see the goodness of it. You'll see something else in it. Humility. Number one is you're not entitled to grace, right? As nice as our rich dad is, right? It's one thing for him to freely give, which he does, and another thing for you to believe that you're entitled to it as though he owes you something and sorry he doesn't. Right? I'm not trying to be a jerk or to put everyone in their place. I just think that we approach, to God, we approach God that way, right? And it's, it's, it's rude, right? On one occasion when Abba Arsenius was in his cell, the, the devils rose up against him and vexed him. And those who used to minister to him came to him, and as they stood outside his hell, they heard him crying out to God, saying, so these disciples of St. Arsenius hear St. Arsenius getting whipped by the devil, um, and they hear Arsenius crying out, saying, O oh God, forsake me not, I have never done before you anything which is good. But grant, O Lord, according to your grace, that I may begin in the way. Right? The reason I'm using this is to say, the great Arsenius, right, who is definitely virtuous, right, is saying, I'm not owed your help, right? He says, I have never done anything good before you, right? So it's not like I did some good, now you owe me as a payment for my goodness to help me. He's like, no, I've done nothing good. I'm purely asking for you to help me, to grace me, right, to gift me deliverance. Right? And that attitude is, is, is really, really important. Right? Like I said, this is a relationship issue. Right? This is not a transactional issue. This is a relationship issue. Right? Because imagine, again, in this analogy of a parent and kid, when the kid's like, how come you haven't bought me a car yet? As though the parents owe you a car. Right? How come you haven't yet done this, that, or the other thing? Right? That there has to be, you, if, the minute that you, you have this entitlement to grace, the relationship is sullied. Right? Do the parents love their kid less? No. Is the relationship enjoyed much? No. Right? God will still delight in you because thankfully God is God. Thank God for God. But like he doesn't get changed like our parents can. Right? God doesn't. Um, but if I believe that I'm entitled, there's an issue. And you'll be seeing so darkly that you'll end up despising God, right? Because you already view yourself above God because you've actually, without even realizing it, decided where grace should be given, right? Of being like, here's where you were supposed to, God. Let me teach you how to be God, right? I'll tell you where to put your funds, right? Like, I have all the funds. I have limitless funds. I can put it anywhere as much as I want, and I'll never run out. Like, I don't need your advice, 
right? And I, and I want to give it, right? Like, I don't have to give it. I made you, didn't I? Right? Like, I didn't need you, right? But we can't feel entitled to grace. So you need to have a lowly mind, the opposite of that. Um, so this was Q&A with the Desert Fathers. Question, how does wisdom dwell in man? Old man, the, the elder. Now, when a man has gone forth to follow after God with a lowly mind, grace gives itself upon him and his conduct becomes strengthened in the spirit and when he hates the world hate meaning doesn't choose the world right means chooses truth first what we talked about yesterday he becomes sensible of the new conduct of the new man which is more exalted than the impurity of the human abode and he meditates in his mind the humility of the rule of the life which is to come and becomes a man of greater spiritual excellence when a person puts themselves below the grace, putting themselves below in, in thought of saying, I'm not truth, I'm not standard, what we talked about yesterday, right? Once he's in a state of being a lowly of mind, is a point where you can now receive because you don't believe that you have everything, that you know everything. Once you're in the position where you can receive, the lights start turning on, right? It's like, the moment where you finally realize that you don't know everything, where let's say you thought you understood why your car broke down. You're like, I know why it is, right? And you're adamant and you're, you're, you're like, this is how it's gonna get fixed. And then you go to the mechanic, the mechanic is like, no, that's not what it is at all. So if you have the position of, well, then he's an idiot, because I know, right? Then good luck fixing your car. But if you have the lowly mind, right? And say, okay, so what is it? you're now in a position to receive both the knowledge and the fixing, right? And because you've been put in the state of knowledge, what he's saying here is a terrible like, analogy, so forgive me, but is he saying that now that you're ready to receive, suddenly you're able to learn. You didn't just get your car fixed, but he gave you new knowledge of being like, oh, I didn't know that that could be how it goes wrong. So can you explain to me what happened there, right? So that if you're the guy who's into cars, right, suddenly, you got new data, right? And now you have something new to work with and you get excited about it being like, hey, I, I didn't know, like I thought it was just this, I have this in my repertoire so that next time I have a, an issue, now I have another thing that I might diagnose, right? And that's what he's saying, right? Is that if I put myself in this vision of lowly mind, I receive grace and with that grace all it becomes a new way of thinking, right? Because I don't think that I know, right? This one yesterday was so important as dry as it was because it's where we mostly are, right? But once I have this lowly mind, things start to change. To get grace, you do have to work. Even though grace is free. Right? So it sounds like an oxymoron and this is where the fights were happening, but it's, it's not. Right? A certain brother fell into temptation and through tribulation relinquished the garb of monkhood. He fell into a warfare and because he was so troubled by it, he took off his monastic garb. And he wanted to begin to renew his ascetical life, but he saw that it was too hard. It sounds familiar to many people, right? We're just like, okay, my life sucks. What was me? Like, I just suck. I don't know if I can ever be what I was before, right? And he is in despair. And he looked at, like, the whole situation, like, could I ever be like I was before, he asks. Um, and because of his fear, he did not begin his work, and he went and made the matter known to an elder, like we said yesterday, discipleship. And the old man said, the elder said, this is the issue. And he said, there's a certain man who possessed an estate. He had a piece of land. And he held it to be of no account. He didn't cultivate it, right? He owned a piece of land. He didn't bother with it. And so it got overcome with weeds, briars, thistles, right? He just left it. And uh, it became full of tangled undergrowth and thorns. Now one day he remembered it. I was like, oh, I have this, this land. And he sent his son and said to him, go clean the estate. So when the kid goes to see the estate, he sees the abundance of the undergrowth and he was afraid, like this monk who lapsed, and said to himself, what will I do to clean all this undergrowth? So what did he do, what we all do? And he threw himself upon a bed and lay down and went to sleep. And thus he did every day. Then his father went forth and found that he was asleep and that he had done nothing. 
And he said to him, How is it, my son, that no work whatsoever has been done by you? And he said to his dad, When I came to work and saw all the undergrowth, I was afraid and said, How am I going to clean all of this? And his father said to him, My son, work according to the measure of sleep each day, and that'll be enough. And when he heard this, the young man plucked up his courage and did thus, and in a short time he cleansed the estate. Thus also you shall not be afraid, but begin the work of your rules, and God, by his grace, will establish you among those in the first rank. Right? I'm just saying, you're not going to experience grace by doing nothing. Right? If you're just asleep, you don't experience anything. Right? It's just your anesthetic. Right? But if you do the work, little by little, you get there. Right? And that's why he said, if you come at it like you need to have it finished in a day, of course you'll despair. You just, just work a little. Right? In a different variation of the story, it was like, just work on a section this big every day. Right? And before long, you're done because you're not looking at, oh my gosh, I have to clean all of this. Right? But you're doing it over here. This is like going to the gym. Right? If you have in your mind, I'm going to get a six pack today, you're not. Right? I promise. Um, but if you are going day by day and then you start learning day by day, like, oh, I also need to think about diet. Oh, I also need to learn a little bit about resistance. Okay, and learning about diet, I actually discovered along the way that like calories in, calories out is a, is a thing. Right? You're, you're acquiring knowledge without realizing it. But, so you're doing this work. Right? But as you're doing this work, you're finding suddenly you have more strength. Right? You might enjoy it. Right? You start noticing that you're not out of breath when you go up the stairs. You enjoy it. Right? So you're seeing these benefits as they go that suddenly you're, you might even be excited about it. Right? You might actually look forward to Azeb uh, of the gym. Right? But it's, it's a change that happens by doing the work. But if you literally just sit there, then it's just this fuzzy concept out there, right? That you don't ever get to experience, right? There has to be work because work puts yourself in the context of cooperation, right? Put, work puts yourself in the, in, the, in the space of dialogue, right? Too many people in this relationship with God do not understand that it's a relationship, right? Relationship means there are two at least parties involved that are in some form of relation, right? And so what we end up doing is looking at these little spots on this thing, this line that connects these two living beings, these individual spots as though they're the relationship, right? I prayed, period, right? I did this activity, right? I went to church, period. I did this activity, right? But that's not relationship. Right? And so you don't experience grace in that way per se. I'm not saying God won't give it, right? When it's just seen as random functions, right? How many of you with your friends are like, what do you want? I spoke to you yesterday, right? I was like, oh, thank God we are friends because we ate together today. Therefore, we are friends, right? Like that's weird, right? No offense. But if, if that's how you define how your friends by random activity, I, I mean, it's just weird, right? Whereas those activities are part of friendship, right? They're part of friendship, but they are not the friendship, right? Because there can be really, really good friends who never have a meal together, right? There can be really good friends who talk once a month or less, right? But it's, it's is that the, the work of friendship, right? is what puts us in the position of receiving from one another, right? Outside of that, then, then you're not going to have it. You're not going to see it. If the kid doesn't go to the tutoring classes, that's a work on his behalf, he doesn't get the benefit of the tutoring. The tutoring was a gift, right? The context of studying was that he was working, the gift was the tutor so that he can also get the, the, 
the amazing medical career, no offense to all the doctors here, um, and, and et cetera, right? Is that there's a context of work. One of the best ways to lose grace, if you want a guaranteed loss of grace, judge people. Game over, right? If, if you want a way for God to be like, nope, it's that, right? Judgment is an almost automatic, like where you took every single possible, you took concrete and put it in front of the flowing fountain, right? I'm like, I don't want it, right? An old man used to say, Become not a lawgiver unto yourself and judge no man, for you are not under the law but under grace. But give you everything to him that is able to do everything, for you are unable to do anything. Judge then in this way and do not sin at any time. If you view yourself as the source of the law, he's saying, Be not a lawgiver unto yourself and judge no others. Right? Because if you do this, you remember that you are under grace. You have no authority. Right? You didn't do anything to even allow you to judge. You're only where you are because of the grace of God. Instead, here's a proper judgment. Right? Is to, is to hand everything over to God, who is able to do everything. You stay away from it. Right? This has nothing to do with you. The moment that you sin in judgment, oh, you come crashing down. Right? Um, a lot of people fear priests judging them in confession. Um, if a priest judges you in confession, they get wrecked. And I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> if you judge someone, I, had, I, I like to put myself on blast because I'm praying that God protect me from doing it again. Right? There was somebody who was a close friend, and I... I thought I had judged him. I don't know that I judged him. I think I just didn't have compassion. And even that was enough, right? Where I was, I was, so I'm like, dude, you're not falling to sin. We were like closer than, than we are closer than brothers, right? And I was like, you're not falling, you're planning your sin, right? And I, was, and, I, and I thought I was helping him. I was aggressive and I was angry. And at some point along the way, without even realizing it, I lost compassion, right? And I was, I, I had hostility towards the, the, the person, right? And I felt entitled to this hostility because of our closeness, right? This is not just a random person I met. We, we grew up together, right? Sure enough, within a couple of months, I found myself as a priest doing things I never did in my life. Never. And I couldn't stop. And I was planning for it over and over and over, and I, I was running towards this sin. And I was crying out to God, and I'm just like, God, like, I, I, I don't even know how to not run and I'm in the middle of the sentence, I'm like, oh, I get it. Okay, <laughs> I called up my friend, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a jerk. <laughs> I'm like, God, please stop now, right? Because if you, if you judge, because in the position of judging, you're forgetting, as was in the saying, you're only where you are by grace, right? There's a very famous story that I should have used here from the Desert Fathers that I love. It's a great story, and actually, that was a story that was in my mind when I fell into that sin, because I used to love this story, and I thought I was the moderate, really good monk in the story, but I'm, I'm not, right? So there's a story of this young guy who joins the monastery, right? And he's all excited, and he's excited to be a monk, and he's assigned an elder. The elder's not that old. We'll call him medium monk, okay? And he's assigned medium monk, right, age-wise. And this new novice falls into this, he, he has thoughts of lust, Right? He hasn't even done anything. Right? He just has lots of lust. And he's excited. He's like, oh, I'm in a monastery. These are great. Like, I'm with all the abunas. And he goes to this elder monk, Aguz Abuna. Um, and he's just like, pray for me, Abuna. I fell into lust. Like, you fell into lust? Habibi, this ain't the place for you. If you can't handle lust, like, go home. Like, this is not your calling. And this poor novice was like, but I really want to be a monk. Right? And he's broken, but he's like, I listen to my elders. He packs his, I don't know, galabeya, um, and he starts leaving, right? And as he's leaving, medium monk finds, like, where are you going? And he goes, I have thoughts of lust, and apparently I'm not cut out for this. And he's like, why are you saying that? He goes, I talked to the elder, and the elder told me, this isn't for you. And he's like, I unpack your galabeya. <laughs> You're fine. Stay here. And the medium monk was praying about it. 
Elder Monk comes to Medium Monk and he goes, Abuna, I don't know what's wrong with me. Pray for me these last three days. I have thoughts of lust like there's no tomorrow. Like since I entered the monastery, I have not had a warfare like this. And Medium Monk goes, Abuna, because you judged the novice. Right? And so the elder humbled himself and said, pray for me that I might be delivered. Right? Um, and I used to think that I was that wise medium monk, like, la, 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 that's not good. And found out, <laughs> I'm not even old, but I fall into the sin of the old guy. Right? Judgment, and, and because this old monk was not aware that, he was living in a state of grace. Right? It was a state of grace. Right? And once you start stealing grace, we have a problem. Okay, so to view this in a different analogy than the, than the dad with the kid one is to use the army analogy is that the commander in chief, okay, the Lord of hosts is distributing his gifts to the whole army, right? There are battalions upon battalions. Someone has to hand out the food, right? Now, if, I, if I'm given food to hand out, Right? It's not because I did anything. None of us did anything. Right? If God has given me food to hand out, and then I start deciding, I start judging who ought to have food and who is good and who isn't, who is worthy of food and who's not worthy of food. It's like, no, I'm not letting, you're not handing out my food. Right? It's not you. You're, you're stealing from my kids. I'm going to give it to somebody else who can do it. Right? So we can lose this protection. We can lose this grace through judgment. That's why judgment is, is really such a serious, very serious sin, right? It, it, it baffles me sometimes, and I'm not trying to make lust less of a big deal, but almost everybody makes lust the decisive factor about how good they are with God, right? They'll come in for confession and be like, things were going so well, Abuna, but I fell into this last week, and they're really like hazin and, and, and uptight about it, right? And then it's like, and, and that's like their thing, like, yeah, 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 right? But on the sin list is the judgment. And it's like, oh, yeah, and I judged. Um, and it's just like, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, like, that's a really big one. Um, it might even be why you're lusting. <laughs> um, like, so that is a big one. Be on guard at all times of your judgment, because if you want to lose grace, that's your golden ticket. Um, We also need to strive so that grace or the help becomes sweet, okay? This is like the, the muscle workout, right? Is that there's a pain, right? Like it's supposed to hurt, right? But there's, there's the good post-workout pain, right? Where it's just like, oh, this is good, right? I'm going to be yoked, right? It's like it's, it's a good kind of pain. The burn, right? I miss those days. Um, I, I speak like it was a thing. It was like a day. Um, a brother asked <laughs> Abba Ammon saying, why is it that a man labors in prayer? Right? I actually, like, the Desert Fathers are beasts. Like, you need to read them because they're so real. If you can get past the old English and realize what they're saying in plain English, is that a monk is going up to an Abba being like, you know, why is it that when a man works hard at prayer and makes petitions, he doesn't get anything? Right? Like, these are real questions. These are the things that we ask, right? How come he doesn't get anything? And the old man said to him, haven't you ever heard how Jacob tired himself for the one that he wanted to wife? Right? And when he didn't get the one that he wanted, he got Leah. It sucks to be Leah. Um, but for her whom he did not seek, how afterwards he worked and toiled more and finally received her whom he loved? That's how it is for the monk, insert for monk Christian also. For he shall fast and keep vigil, and yet shall not receive that which he asks, and again will labor with fasting and vigil, and then receives the gift of grace for which he asked. That there's a beauty in the striving. This is going to sound like such a horrible example compared to this elder who just gave a good example. Like, I felt this when I started working. I was so disappointed when I was able to just buy stuff, as crazy as that sounds. 
I remember liking when I wanted a Nintendo game, having to wait for it, <laughs> right? That I had to save up, I had to get Mama and Baba's permission. Like you had to get in line, you had to wait for it. It wasn't just, it wasn't just like you could walk in and get it. I couldn't just do that. Like, do you think dad's gonna say yes? Right? And then me and my brother and sister would be like, you ask, he likes you more, right? Like, and then be like, oh, ask, did he say yes? Okay, sick, how are we gonna do this, right? There was a beauty in that. And so when I could just walk to the electronics department and hand a card, I'm like, this feels weird, right? Or even like, I used to, when I go to St. Anthony's Monastery, it was missions. Like, I'd have to take a bus to a city to get on another bus that only comes at a certain time to then be dropped off at the beginning of the medet, to then wait for the water truck to come in so that I could get on top of it, right, to carry me in, and I could wait for hours in the sun for that to come, right, if I missed one or if there wasn't room. And I'd feel the sweetness of entering, of being like, yes, right? Then the grace had a flavor, right? The gift had a taste, right? And so when suddenly, apparently, Abunas shouldn't take more slot in Egypt, right? When they're like, oh, we'll get you a driver. I'm like, this feels cheap. Like, I, like, I don't know, it felt weird. And I'm like, I, I want to hitchhike. <laughs> um, it had a sweetness to the labor, right? And so the work actually makes grace have flavor because you participated in it. Right? You were partnered with God in it. It makes it beautiful. Right? It, it, it's completely different. It's the same thing as parents when they, they can just hand their kid food, but there's something different when the kid participates in it. Even if, they, even if what they did meant nothing. Right? Even if it's just like, okay, can you open like, the package? Bravo, Habibi, thank you. Right? You helped me cook today. Right? And that little kid is just like, wow, I did. Right? And then they'll show up like, I cooked with mom. Right? And it's, it's different. It's like my dad used to be like, can you cook with me? Which was translation for clean everything I do so your mom doesn't get angry. Right? But it was a participation in the act of cooking. <laughs> right? It was a participation. Right? That there was, there was something beautiful about it. It gives it a sweetness. If you want a sure way to get grace, love others. Love others. A brother asked an old man saying, how is it that there are at this present men who labor? This quote like, scared me. I put this online when I was prepping for this talk because I, I found this one so true and so judging of our generation and really scary. A brother asked an old man saying, how is it that at this time there are men, men being monks, but insert Christians here, who do work, they're working, but they're not getting the same grace that the early fathers did. Kind of like how you might hear, feel hearing these stories of being like, where are those days, right? Like how come we don't get these answers? We don't have this stuff happening. The old man with sobriety just says, in the past love existed. Instant dropping of a bomb. In the past love existed and so one brother was raised up by another. Now love has grown cold and we each drag each other down and in consequence, we do not receive grace. Right? The act of loving, choosing another, which is what love means. If I'm choosing another, and that's why, again, what we were talking about yesterday, choosing gospel. If instead of choosing myself, what love works in cold, I can see that my brother or sister is down. I say, I'm exhausted but I can see that my friend is down. How would I go comfort them? Right? Yo, do you want to go out? Let's go for a walk. Let's go watch a movie. Let's play a game. Right? Just I, like, you seem out of it. Are you okay? Right? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm struggling with something. You don't need to talk about it. Do you want to just chill? What do you need from me? What can I do with you? Right? Noticing that somebody is sick. Right? How many of you, like, Think about whoever is in your parish that's in college or university. How many of you have ever thought, let's make care packages and just drop it off at their dorm or at their house? Right, let's just let's give, them, like, give them food, just that they know that they were thought of. Right, these random acts of love, right? And it doesn't have to be that physical, but the acts of loving, 
change the whole environment, right? It changes a person's entire mood. It changes their disposition, right? It makes them think about others. And almost always when a person receives love, they want to give more love to others, right? Of being like, man, that was sick. I can't believe that they did that, right? How many people look for the good in others and praise the good in others, right? How many times have you been with somebody just being like, man, that was really nice of you? And just said it out loud, not just in your head, right? Being, that was really kind of you, right? Or somebody tells you about a situation they're in and being like, wow, you are very patient, right? Calling out a, a, a virtue, right? By loving others, by choosing others, we are in the position by giving that God wants to give more. I can trust you with my money to distribute to others, right? Because you're always choosing others, not yourself. But the more we, excuse me, the more we choose ourselves, you don't feel grace because you're not in the position of receiving. It's done. You're not poor in spirit. And so grace comes from God as helps in cooperation with our will, right? But there is a special category of grace that are extra. So there's, a, uh, there's the baseline money that everybody gets, okay? There's the living expenses that we all have. You're living at home, you're not paying rent, okay? But there, is an, there are extra graces that God can give depending on the cooperation of that person with God, which is, I don't want to say struggle for grace that you can get this, I'm just saying that this can be a consequence. Like exorcism. On one occasion, an old man went up from Shahid to the brethren in the mountain, and when they saw that he was a man of great ascetic labors, he was working, and that he practiced stern self-denial, love, they entreated him to let them make a meal for him, and they brought him a little wine to drink. Now when the people of the country heard about him, they brought him a man who was afflicted with the devil that he might heal him. And when the devil saw him, he began to revile him, saying, Oh, you brought this drunk to me? Right, the devil is mocking the elder. And the old man did not wish to cast him out because of the praise of men. So the man had the gift of exorcism. He didn't want to, right? He didn't want the people to be like, oh, wow, Abuna is an exorcist. But because the devil had reviled him, he said to him, I believe in Christ. And I will not even drink this cup of wine until you have left. And as he began to drink, that devil cried out and said, you are consuming me. And before the old man could drink the cup of wine, the devil went forth by the grace of Christ. Right? By the help of Christ, by the free money of Christ, not by the free money of the elder. Why the elder? A person who can be entrusted is the one that God's going to give. Think of this battalion thing again. If there is supplies, we need clothing because the, the army is fighting in bitter winter. The one who is being like, let me hook up my friends. Let me hoard in my closet in case my, my jacket tears. That's not the guy you're going to trust with the money. Right? That's not the one you're going to trust with the goods of being like the guy takes it for himself. Right? And so my kids or my soldiers are suffering because this guy is stealing. Right? The one that it is is the one who's selfless, which is what this elder was. Right? Always concerned about his loyalty to the commander, his ascetical labors. Right, his relationship to the commander and his love towards the brethren. He's like, I can trust you. Right? Imagine if the government of Canada is saying we need to distribute, like we had some major famine and we need to distribute food. Who are they going to look at first? The nonprofits with a good reputation. Naturally. Right? They need to distribute it now. They're not like, okay, we're going to train 20 people and no one's going to eat till we do. Right? They're like, who's doing this well already that we can already trust? Right? That's who I'm going to give it to, right? And so that's why when a person's already doing this, then God be like, yeah, you, I can trust you, right? And if a person starts stealing that grace or self-attributing that grace, right, judgment among other ways, then God's like, no, no. I still love you, but no, you can't distribute this, right? That's not, that's not for you anymore. Or... Revelation. So I'm using exorcism as an example, but there are other gifts because any spiritual gift, which is an extra grace, that's a divine grace, that's not baseline, like I said, living expenses, right? For some people's clairvoyance, for some people's healing, 
right? But these are different gifts that are for the family. They're for the family. They're not for the one who has them. The person who has them only has them because God is dispensing it. He's the, he's the great pharmacist. We're always talking about doctors, right? He's the, he's the master dispenser, okay? Um, and he's giving it out, right? And he is he involving us in that giving out. He is synergizing with us. And he's adding grace upon grace. He's adding to our work his own. Grace as an extra, as revelation, right? To what extent is a man held capable of revelation? A man asked the elder and the old man said, to the same extent as a man is capable of stripping off sin, both internally and externally. For when a man dies by spiritual sacrifice, he dies to all the words and deeds of this habitation of time, and when he has committed his life to the life which is after the revivification, the re-enlivenment, divine grace bestows itself upon him, and he becomes capable of divine revelations. For the impurity of the world is a dark covering before the face of the soul, and it prevents it from discerning spiritual wisdom. What is he saying in plain English? Right? That when a person does what we were talking about yesterday, keeps choosing right, one of the gifts, these extra gifts that he can have is that by killing off disease, by pursuing health, he can see clearly, right? Now he can, do, he can, he can div, discern, he can see beyond material, right? Now he can see truth, right? He can see God, right? The pure in heart can see God, right? As a divine grace. And now they have spiritual wisdom, Right? These are why there are people gifted among us that you can go to that can just spiritually look at you and tell you what's going on. That's a grace. And it's a grace that came from labor that God gave grace upon grace. So saying, I am gracing your labor with my cooperation. Right? I'm not only going to help you fight because you're fighting. I'm not only going to feed you because you're fighting. I'm not only going to spend on you as a soldier because you're fighting. I'm going to give you lessons and strength training. And that when you do go through all these different practices, as you become a mighty warrior, you don't even know when it happened, but suddenly you can see combat so clearly, right? There are soldiers on the ground who can just see in front of them. How do I use this sword? They're, they're stuck in the right now. How do I like, get stronger biceps? But there are others who are over there that are like, you need this training, you need this training, this training. The enemy's over there doing this. This battalion needs to meet over here. This guy needs an archer. This guy, somebody hand him a shield. This, and they just, they see all of it, right? By looking, just by looking, right? And it's just that, right? For those of you who have had the privilege of meeting someone like that, it's mind-blowing. Um, like, I've met people like that where I'm just like, how did he know that? Um, and it's like on point. And it's because it is a grace. It's not that person's intellect, it's not their intellect. It is God has gifted them of seeing, right, with real sight. He graced them. He gifted them with something that does not belong to them by nature, right? He took what is ours and gave us what is his, right? We praise and glorify him. Um, sometimes grace is a temporary gift. We call these visitations of grace, okay? Okay. And sometimes, and, and this is where you definitely need a spiritual father, because sometimes what you think is a visitation of grace is not. It's the devil laying off of you to wreck you, right? So sometimes the devil is like, everybody stop. Demons, just stop. Leave them alone, right? And so that you feel amazing because there's no warfare, right? And you're like, this is the life, right? But he's planning to assassinate you. Um, and so then he just lets all of them out at once, and then you're like, what is this, and where is God, and woe betides me, and blah, blah, blah. But that's demonic. But sometimes Christ seeing your labors or seeing what needs you may have, I call them like heavenly lollipops, okay, where he's just like, khud <laughs> habibi, right? Where he's just like, rayah have, have, have a break, right, and enjoy. And, and it, it can serve so many different reasons, right? It can be that you're in a position where there is no comfort of any kind in any way, right? And you're, on the, you're, you're about to give up. He's like, no, 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 I see you, right? Sometimes it's because he knows what kind of warfare you're going to have of saying, I know you don't believe that prayer could ever be nice. 
I know you're bored out of your freaking mind reading the Igbeya. And so I'm going to give you this little lollipop that when you're having, you didn't realize that it is possible to like the Igbeya. It is. Right? Where you find yourself, sorry, my allergies are acting up. You find yourself um, enjoying things that you didn't think you could enjoy, and you've probably experienced that in your life, where suddenly you didn't mind liturgy. Suddenly it wasn't, oh my Lord, like, when has he done? Right? And why don't the deacons, like, hurry up? Right? Or like, Abuna's doing arhamna, oh Lord, like, for real arhamna. Right? Where it's like, like, finish. Right? I've, I have those moments. Right? Whereas suddenly you find yourself being like, you're already done? Right? And you didn't know that you could like it. Right? Or you find yourself suddenly like, I don't know what it is. I couldn't stand that person and suddenly I'm fine. Right? It gives you a, a, a little taste of health. Right? Uh, maybe another way to say it is you got a steroid injection, like a, a legal steroid injection. Right? Where suddenly the pain is, is gone. Right? And you didn't know, you didn't even know that it was possible to not have the pain. Right? You didn't even know where there was pain. Right? And so when suddenly you have that, it's just like, wow, this is nice. Right? And that experience of health makes the pursuit of health easier. Right? And then saying, okay, you know that health is possible? Okay, now, now go pursue health. And it's a grace of God that he takes away that grace. Because he's saying, your participation in it is what makes it beautiful. Right? I don't want to right? I don't want to I don't want to give you the the not that he's testing us, life is its own test. He's saying, I don't want to give you the answers to the test. I want you to taste the fruits of studying and acing it. And with God, like a one out of a hundred is acing it. <laughs> right? But he's just saying, but eat eat of the fruit of your labor. Right? And that's the beauty of it, of saying that you're participating in the vineyard. The vineyard is God's. And he's saying, Come labor with me. And eat of the fruit. And you're going to enjoy the fruit even more because you participated in it. Right? It tasted different because you were in it. Yes. Because I... I, I I'm not paraphrasing wrong. When I was saying, like, no, no, I'm worried that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it wrong. Um, he's saying, why are people averse to this concept of, of labor? Um, and a person who, he said that a person who's grown fruit in their backyard, right, is eating for free, but there was labor in it. So, like, why is there an aversion to it? And I, I don't get it. Like, to be honest, I don't understand what the aversion is because there's, Every single thing you do is work, right? Like on a, on a physical level, right? Like to get up and eat, you did work, right? Like even that was a work, right? I think the sensitivity, I think, is about merit, right? Is this concern about earning it as though you weren't good enough to have it? And I think that's where the conversation went wrong. Or like, am I, did I earn it by being good enough for God to give me money? Right? And that's the age old fight between like the Protestants and, and traditional Christianity. Um, where it's like, I don't think anyone's actually fighting about that. Right? What we're saying is, if you don't eat, you die. Right? Like, that, that's what we're saying. We're not saying, if you're good enough, you eat. <laughs> we're saying, you must eat. Right? And that you have to eat him, and he gave himself. We didn't give him. Right? And so that differentiation maybe matters in, like philosophically, but no, I don't think anyone's actually making the argument, right? Actually making the argument about that. Um, and I, get, I guess I get that there can be a mistakenness, even with what I'm saying, that when I'm saying you have to work to receive grace, I have not once said that you, you've earned it, right? Or deserved it, right? That's not a, that's not a thing, right? And that's what, I, that's what I'm saying with God, one out of a hundred is amazing, right? Good job, buddy, 
right? Like, that's something he, he doesn't have this scale that we created. But he's saying, but participate with me, right? That this is, this is all for us. Um, and so grace can come as different gifts, right? And so, like, the, the things we were talking about yesterday, God can grace you with these things, right? So if you, had, if you were cognitively, the, the reason for your falls or incapacity or your weakness is cognitive, grace can fix that. Right? Of saying, let me show you how things are. Right? There's a story. They used to relate that a certain elder entreated God and made supplication to him that the devils might appear to him. Right? He actually asked God to see the devils. And it was revealed to him, he heard this voice saying, it's not necessary for you to see them. But the old man entreated anyway, saying, Lord, you are able to hide me in your grace. Thank you so much. Then God opened his eyes, and he saw them like bees surrounding a man, and they were gnashing their teeth upon him, and the angels of God were rebuking them and driving them away from men. The story is beautiful on so many levels, right? Like, on one level, okay, the guy is a kid, right? This elder, he's an old man, but he's a kid. He's like, I want to see him, right? Like, yeah, just, I just want to see him, right? Whoever in their mind is like, I want to see devils, right? But apparently he does, right? And he's like, no, I want to see them. And then he hears God answering, being like, you don't need to. He's like, I want to. And see the, the humility of God, again, his cooperation, right? Because he knows this man is laboring. He's like, okay, fine. Right? So he lets him see him, right? And in seeing them, he sees that they're like bees. That like God made him see them in a particular way to be like, they're just, that's all they are. And look at how strong these angels are. He was given a vision of how the angels are strong and they're swatting them. And the angels of God are rebuking them and driving them away from men, Right? this elder now had an insight to seeing more clearly, right? Spiritually, he was seeing more clearly. Cognitively, he was seeing more clearly, right? Now he's more informed. Whenever he's advising these other novices that are around him, it's going to have a different taste to it, right? Among many other beautiful things. Um, grace can actively stop part of a, of a temptation. Um... If you want grace is, is in the moment of temptation and you, you want to sin but you don't, is, is to come before God, right? A brother said to an elder, what shall a man do in every temptation which comes upon him and during every thought of the enemy? And the old man said, it is right for a man to weep before the grace of God so that he may help him and he shall speedily find relief and he make, if he make his supplication with knowledge for it is written, the Lord is my helper, the Lord is my gracer. Um, I will not be afraid what man will do to me. Um, I'll read this other story and come back to it. A brother asked one of the old men, saying, If I'm being tempted and temptation comes upon me, and I have no one in whom I have confidence to tell about it, what will I do? Right? So I'm in, a, I'm in temptation. There's nobody around. I can't get any help. There's no one I can even talk to. And the old man says, I believe in God. Like, it's such a strong answer. I believe in God. I believe in God and that he will send his grace and will comfort you and give you strength if you will ask him in truth and will make supplication unto him. For I have heard that a matter like unto this took place in Shahid, when there was a man whose rule and conduct were excellent and he fell into temptation. So a really good guy, he fell into temptation and became oppressed in his mind and because he had no one in whom he had confidence to reveal the matter to and none to bid him to be of good courage, he made himself ready to depart. He was ready to leave monasticism and just peace out. And behold, the grace of God appeared unto him by night in the form of a virgin, and she comforted him, saying, Depart not, but dwell here with me, for not one of the things of which I have heard shall be performed. And straightway his mind was healed, and he was consoled and strengthened. When we have none but God, he comes through. I had a similar experience to this monk when I was uh, a novice in the monastery, and there was no elders in the monastery that I was at, and it was driving me crazy. I wanted an elder because I was used to in Egypt that there were elders. Um, and I was troubled, and my father confession, like, was the bishop of the monastery, so he wasn't there a lot. Um, and so I had this thought one night where, like, just there was issue after issue, and young novices, like, suck. Um, and they need lots, I needed, like, tons, I still need tons of help mentally and in every way. Um, but I was just like, I guess I should leave. I guess I should leave. Uh, there's no elder here, right? And I, I need an elder. And... I had a rule and I would just follow it, right, of what you read and the, like all monks are supposed to read the paradise. And so that night I opened my paradise 
Um, and as I'm reading, it goes, it so happened one day that there was a young novice who said, behold, I must leave this place for there is none to teach me. I was like, hmm. Um, and he was like, and so he <laughs> packed his galabaya like the other guy. Um, and he's leaving and he went down to sleep. And a woman appeared to him that I took to be the Virgin Mary and said, take your stuff and go back and your cell will teach you. Right? That when there is, in that I, I was helped, I was graced. Right? Is that when there is no one to help, right, God comes through. God likes to work through others. Right? Don't view God's grace as always having to be this only through his hand directly, magically, mysteriously. Like, no, it's just as magically mysterious through the body, right? That the body has a function. But when there is no one in the body to help, God will come through directly, right? Because what is the effect of grace? This is going to sound so, maybe so dumb, but it's not. As the Desert Father said, first of all, divine grace makes a man hot with the love of God. And he hates all the glories and honors of this world. Right? That might seem boring, but it's not. Right? And that's why it's about coming first up of like, what do you want? Right? Because it's like, if I've tasted health, my pursuit of health, what does it do? It makes me love health. Right? And so it makes me love him more. And next, he comes in a state of poverty to rule this life. It's counterintuitive. I was saying, I love grace so much, I want to always receive. I don't, I don't want anything other than to be a beggar. So counterintuitive. And divine grace itself first gives him the love of labors, and suddenly you like laboring, and it makes the things which are hard easy. Right? It changes everything. And it protects him from the fierce attacks of the war of devils so that they may not worse over wish and will assault him, but only according to his strength and his capacity and as is convenient for his growth. And thus, after many labors, suddenly grace is making me work, right? And contest, his heart is purified with abundant humility and he shines with the light of grace and he is held to be worthy to see Christ in a revelation of light. It puts them on the path of truth, right? It's completely transformative. Um, I've taken too long, so I'll try and, 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 and fast forward this last part, but God also gives his grace according to personalities, right? And the Desert Fathers talked about this. The old man said, in very many ways did God give grace. Sometimes divine grace moves a man suddenly, as it did with Abba Moses the Ethiopian. Sometimes by the hearing of scriptures, as in the case of Mar Antony and Mar Simon the Stylite. Others by doctrine of the word, as in the cases of St. Serapion and St. Basarion. Right? And he goes on, of saying that God also knows what help matches each personality. Right? And so it's important for you to seek God as you are, because God will respond to you as you are. Right? He'll always move you towards truth, but he's not going to be like, well, here's the thing, bro, you need to now take a vow of silence but you're, you're like Moses and you just want to laugh and chill with people. You're not Arsenius. Cool, right? Is that he does do that. Um, asceticism is a means of grace, but I, I won't spend time on that now, like the, the striving, the workouts. But I'll just end with a statement that God is sovereign over his grace. No one can decide where God is puts his grace, how God puts his grace, how much grace that he can give, no one, right? The church through the mysteries is dispensing his grace, but God alone is sovereign over his grace, right? We have, we have a rich dad, as one elder told me once, right? We have a very rich dad. I was talking to this one elder, God opposes to Abun Antonio Sisoriani, last story and I'll shut up, um, but he called me one time when I was a sinning, which was his custom, which was really intrusive. Um, and so he, he called me, um, and I was just like, yeah, I, I suck. I don't know how. I'm a priest. Like, I'm filthy. He was like, right? Like, forget that kind of talk. And I was just like, okay, like, I think I'm being humble. Um, and he was just like, Abuna, you have a rich dad. I was like, yes. 
Um, and he's like, your dad is rich. He gave you a grace, a gift called priesthood. And with all my respect to Otsak, it's just a gift. And he gave everybody gifts, not just you. Right? You received a gift called priesthood that has a particular function. But every single one of his daughters and sons also received gifts. So this has nothing to do with intakwais and tawahis, you're good, you're bad, you're worthy, it's irrelevant. Right? Just be faithful with the gift, with the grace that you have received. And this is the humility of God. That God emptied himself and took the form of a servant. Right? That graced us with, the, with, with wearing our flesh to grace it with his. Right? To give unto man what was not his by nature, but according to grace. Again, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. We praise him and glorify him now and always to age of ages. Amen. Any questions, Does comments, have criticisms? So I, I have two questions, but they're, no, they're uh, not related to each other. First one, at first you mentioned that uh, not having grace is mostly because of us. It's our fault. Is this always the case? Or God sometimes allows, to, allows his grace to be uh, withdrawn from us to teach us anything? Second question is, you mentioned later that uh, sometimes it's demonic warfare, warfare when we're not getting fought with anything and then he comes after much harder warfare. And you said sometimes it's God's grace, so how do we know which is which? So the first one, it doesn't always have to be God, quote unquote, not giving grace. Because, like we said, God, like God's sovereign over His grace. But sometimes it's just wrong. I think we have that's something we can't view as God owing us something. So, for example, let's say my dad is rich and powerful, which he is, right? And I'm failing a test. Let's say my dad has enough social status to go bribe the school to pass me anyway. Should he? just because he can, right? Or might their opposition being like, no, I'm not encouraging a wrong, right? Not because I'm mad at you, so you can learn, right? And so that you, can, you can, so that you can benefit. So it's not always that God is not giving a grace just because I'm doing good or bad. That's something we don't earn it. But it's like he is raising us, we're his kids, right? And so in raising us, there's decisions that have to be made Right, about what is good for my kid, and he knows when he needs to step in to help, right? And that's why I started off with, you'll only have that when you're in relationship, right? When you're in relationship, now we're in the context where he can be like, that see, will like, let him suffer a bit, right? Let him really taste this and understand it. And he's standing right beside you, he never leaves you, right? Which is his own grace, right? But he's standing right beside you and knowing when is the right time to be like, Right? Versus other times where it's I'm running towards the sin. He has nothing to do with that. Right? Where I'm running towards whatever the illness is. Right? Then it's I'm choosing to be away from grace. Right? So the periods of non grace don't have to mean that he's doing something. They can. It can be because of my choice. It can be because of what's supposed to come from it. It can be a bunch of things. But it doesn't necessarily at all mean that Rabban is at it. Right? In the same way, for example, it's like if your kid goes to school and someone bullies him, are you going to be like, all right, no more school for you? No. Right? You're going to teach them how to deal with bullying. You might work through this. Like, there's going to be, there's going to be a whole thing around it. So God does the same. Um, with regards to the differentiating them, I'd rather you leave that to your guide. Um, to be honest with you, otherwise, like, you can fall hard. But I would also say, it doesn't matter. Because if I'm struggling to do what's right at all times, I'll be trying to do what's right in the good seasons and in the hard seasons, right? And the source of grace won't matter. In the same way, for example, I've seen couples where they've had periods of poverty, where they're literally living from paycheck to paycheck. 
and others where there's excess, right? They have to learn how to live in both, right? Of like, how do I live when I'm rich and how do I live when I'm poor? Because I have to keep living, right? So the same thing with righteousness. We have to pursue righteousness whether I'm in a happy state or non-happy state um, or not, but leave the differentiation for the spiritual guide because there are definitely lessons to learn from both, right? There are lessons to learn from both, but if I keep on presuming to dissect it, I'm probably just gonna fall more. <laughs> Good question. Peter. Uh, the verse, thank you. The verse that says, um, grace upon grace, like in the prologue, now I'm forgetting the context, but it, that he, through Jesus Christ, there was grace upon grace that was given. Um, how do you understand that in light of everything, like in a practical sense, like? How do you hear that last part? How to understand what? Sorry, I the can... grace upon grace. Yeah. But through Jesus Christ, there was, I don't remember how the verse exactly is. Um, yeah. Like that grace upon grace is given. I, like what does it mean that through Jesus Christ, grace upon grace is given? What does the verse mean exactly in a practical sense in terms of everything that you were saying? To shut you, Peter. Um, <laughs> I'm generally curious. Because he's the master of the Gospel of John. Um, yeah. I don't think I could do it even remotely any justice. I mean, every, everything in existence is grace because nothing is, nothing is self-entitled, nothing is self-existence. So the act of anything being made is already grace. The act of existence is grace, right? The covenant of the Old Testament was grace of God choosing, of God acting, of God working. The incarnation was his own grace as its own rescue mission, as identity, as theosis, as the whatever word you want to use, um, as, as, as deification, right? As participation in the divine life right? That's his own grace. But the help in the moment is a grace, right? The, the release of, 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 a bond, of a bond is grace, right? The comfort in a, in, in a, in a hard time is, is a grace, right? And so that's why it's grace upon grace upon grace. It's gift upon gift. It's money flowing. It's water giving life, right? From an ever-flowing fountain. So it's like, it's like the water doesn't end. So it's like it's more and more and more and more and more, right? I don't, I, I couldn't possibly do the verse any justice in explanation. I bet Cyril can, um, and I bet Abuna Kurlis Murad can. Um, <laughs> we should get him to. You're missed in Vancouver. Um, <laughs> Go for it. Um, hello. Um, First of all, thank you for the topic. It's beautiful words. Um, I just, it's a comment mixed with a question, so uh, it's actually two. So the first is um, grace, a blessing of the, like a fruit of the Holy Spirit, or does it something, because I remember the like seven fruits of the Holy Spirit or something like this in the gospel, I don't remember which one. Um, so is grace a, a fruit of, tree of the Holy Spirit or is it something on its own that God gives to each of his followers independently and the last thing is um, when you said that you receive priesthood and this is your blessing so how does each one of us know what his, his blessing is I mean our blessings are numerous and they're countless and every day we have new ones opportunity in of itself is a blessing but for example yours is a parent you're a priest or priesthood it's a parent like there's no denying it. So how do we, each of us, know um, how we can better serve or know our blessing in of itself? I, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. So I couldn't actually hear all of it. Oh, um, okay. I heard um, um, is grace um, a fruit or a gift, and and then uh, knowing what a gift you said, but for some reason it's it's muffled. My bad. Okay, uh, I'll say it again, and I'll put my voice louder. So sorry. So, I said, is grace fruit of the tree of the Holy Spirit within each one of us? Because I know there are numerous uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit, like love, kindness, tender, hardness, all of these. There are multiple, do I remember all of them? That's the first question. And is it given independently? Or, because you said that grace on each person is different from the other. 
and there God is sovereign over his grace so he can attribute it as he deems fit and the second one is uh, when you were saying that priesthood in of itself is a blessing and a grace so my question was yours is apparent because uh, you're a priest but for example us who are living on a daily life in a society so how would we know what our grace is um, yes yeah. did I make it clear so there's two kinds of grace, right? There's, that's what I'm saying, there's the living expenses, <laughs> right, Where we, that we all have. Like there's, there's, there's a grace that we all receive. And then there's gifts of the Spirit that that's, that's specific and not everyone has necessarily um, those, right? Like gifts, like, like the, the special gifts, like clairvoyance, healing, etc. Not everybody has those. I personally believe, and I could be wrong, that... In every generation, there are people that have those. It just doesn't mean that we all have to have those. Um, and so, there's, in my view, there's almost no point in striving for the gifts of the Spirit because we can't force God's hand, right? Like, God will distribute as he sees fit. Um, so that's why I'm like, there's both kinds of grace. We're all recipients of grace, right? But special gifts, and those were in the analogy, the, I mean, everybody's, everyone's receiving food in the army, but not everyone's a distributor, right? So there's, there are two categories, right, of those. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the, the other ones. Um, knowing what your gift is, because everyone has, everyone is gifted, right, on some level. Um, that, that requires some self-evaluation. Um, and I think transparency with um, a spiritual director, right? I often ask people, like, if you were to have, like, three days off where you could schedule whatever you wanted with no restrictions, no social restrictions, no sleep restrictions, no money, like, nothing, what would you do, right? Because where, what they choose to do is probably what, they're, what they love the most. And what people love the most is usually what they're best at, right? And what they're best at is probably indicative of somewhere where your gift is, right? And so, because that's why you enjoy it, right? And what you're good at is what you share with God, right? So you're going to interact best with God through that gift. Right? So for example, the person, there are people who just naturally ask about people. They're not, they, 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 like, they, no one tells them to, they just do it. Right? They love it. Right? That person is going to find a special grace, that's a special grace, right? It's a, it's a, it's a gift, it's a charism. And who did they receive it from? God himself. Right? It's an attribute, it's a characteristic of him. Right? And so then if they start working on that, they're gonna find their link with God strengthened because they have something to talk to God about, right? Same, like a person who views that, they'll, they'll connect with God on the pastoral level of like, how do you love us this way, God? How do you see this person? God, I'm so worried about this. They're gonna have, that's gonna be their content, right? An artist is gonna be like, oh my, my God, literally, <laughs> right? The beauty, right? You like, look at these colors, right? Look at these, hear these sounds, right? So what I'm saying is, when you're saying, how do we find out our gift? I'm suggesting that as a starting place, right, of finding out that with the self-reflection and the guidance um, to be able to discover where you are at um, is, is a way of discovering where, where you're gifted personally and then developing that, like, actively. But I think I'm missing the third. I forgot one of them. Okay, perfect. I don't know if I really answered, so my bad. Louder. I can't hear through this thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I feel so deaf. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay. So it's a two-part question. The first part is, um, is there a type of good judgment and a type of bad judgment? And the reason I ask is because you said um, judgment like, kills grace and love boosts it. And I'm wondering, I guess the second part is, um, like if you're in the position to care uh, or love for someone like a child or something. And that requires some sort of, like, I'm gonna use judgment, maybe not the right word. How does that affect grace? I didn't hear the last part. What was the scenario you're describing, the, the analogy? Like if you're in the, 
if you're in the position to love or care for someone that requires judgment, I'm using the word loosely, um, like a child, for example, um, how does that affect grace? So one is that you don't judge based on you. Like if you're in a situation of responsibility that you judge on truth and discerning um, rightness or wrongness of actions is completely different than like rightness or wrongness of, of persons. If you can avoid even the rightness or wrongness of actions would be even better, right? But I'm just saying it, it wouldn't itself be intrinsically sinful to identify that an action is wrong, right? But to not presume, take it in a legal sense. In judgment, you prosecuted and cast a verdict on someone. You've presumed to have all the data to even do that, right? Often you've robbed somebody of a defense, right? And that's why the Desert Fathers say, rather than judge, do two things. Become the defense attorney for the person you're prosecuting. And if you want to take it even further for perfection, self-prosecute. Right? That, that's what the Desert Fathers would say. Um, so if you're, in a, if you're in a position of, of authority where you must, then you will never, you will do it with fear and trembling, and you still won't judge the person. You might just have to discern what you have to do in a situation, but you won't presume to judge the person involved, right? Because you'll view everybody as ill, including yourself, right? So it won't be a question of like, how ill is this person? How bad are they? It'll be, how do I with my illnesses and this person with their illnesses interact, right? So again, to bring it to a health analogy, if I happen to notice that somebody is in a wheelchair, I'm not judging them by saying, I notice that they have a handicap. I just know that they have a handicap, right? That's different than being like, oh, you handicap person, right? You like, whor like whatever negativity can come from, from disease. But if I think of everything like, okay, yeah, that person is in a wheelchair and I like have a limp arm, right? And that other guy has like the weak sauce legs and like somehow together in this room, we need to get up and put that picture up on the wall. How do we work with each other? Right? Like, that's all it is. Right? So I won't, but I won't be assessing their diseases, identifying diseases. What gets noticed gets noticed, but I won't look for it. Um, but again, only use gospel. Because the gospel doesn't ask you what's wrong with the other person. The gospel tells you how to respond no matter what kind of person. Sick bus. Is that okay? Thank you, Buna. Uh, I think my question is more along the same lines of judgment as well, and you might have partly answered it, but uh, how does one uh, notice in the moment when they are actually judging someone? Because I think that's a weakness that I personally have, and I might do it and not even realize what I'm doing. So how can I have kind of trigger to be like, wait, this is what I'm doing right now? I think the opposite of judgment is humility, right? So I would encourage people to self-reflect every day as St. Anthony, the best saint in the world taught, um, and to examine oneself, their conduct, their speech, their thoughts, right? Because pay attention to your thoughts of, if I was annoyed today, why was it? If I have ill will or I'm just not happy or don't like someone, why? Because there's probably judgment behind it, right? Of being like, because that person's a bad person, because that person is this, that, or the other thing, right? And I think we're in a climate that judges all the time. Like, it baffles me that, like, our, I'm, not, I'm not ranting, but we're all about contemporary society, like, don't judge, you don't judge me. I mean, you're, you're judging the heck out of everyone. Um, like, I'm like, you're nonstop, right? Like, like, there's a clear position about what you're supposed to be. But I'm saying, ask yourself if you're doing that, right? Um, qu statements like, obviously, clearly, you've, you've probably cast a judgment. Now, ask yourself if that judgment that you made, the obvious and clearly, was obvious and clear because of the gospel or because of me. Right? Like, then I'm saying judgment can even start to be uprooted if you're careful in speech. 
right? That my speech is not presumption, presum presumptive, presumptuous, right? Um, my feelings towards other people, who do I avoid and who do I like, right? Um, where, where do my thoughts go, right? If you're assessing a scenario, whether it's at work or with family, being like, here's what they should have done. You use the word should, you've judged. You've cast a verdict that the right to do was whatever I thought. Was that should based on the gospel, right? By, by being that meticulous, you won't judge. Another way, as Dorotheus of Gaza would teach, is to always self-accuse, right? Of, of being like, what am I doing wrong? As an immediate reaction to whatever wrong that I called out, right? Let's say I noticed somebody lied, right? I can be like, okay, well, I lie all the time. That's one way of self-accusing. Another way would be like, oh no, what am I doing that makes this person scared to say the truth in front of me? The problem is me, right? That's a whole other level, right? That's the self-prosecution, right? I think if that becomes part of our vocabulary, you will become much more sensitive. You're not only to stop judging, you'll become much more sensitive to when you are and when judgment in general is occurring, right? And to not allow wrong speech, right? If you in your crowd, I don't mean you specifically, you being any of us, if gossip is part of your world, you're, you're asking for it, right? Sarcasm. Sarcasm is humor at the expense of someone, right? And so there's, there's a judgment. Like sarcasm accentuates judgment, right? Of who is the obvious wrong. And that's why it's so obviously wrong that we can ridicule, right? It's, 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 a, it's a big one, right? So I think speech, thoughts, examination, self-prosecution, um, and get exercises get exercises from, from your spiritual guide, right? Of like, what are ways that I can actively practice not judging or the opposite to strengthen humility, either one of those. Okay, so we thank our Father for leading us through this discussion. It's uh, the first of three segments today, um, obviously starting with the one last night. Right now, we're going to take a break, and we're going to go have lunch together downstairs. So right now, it's uh, about 2.53. We're going to come, sorry, 1.53. We'll come back here at 2.30, and we'll have our second spiritual talk of the day. Um, for those of you who had questions and didn't get a chance to ask them, there is going to be a Q&A session along with the conclusion later today uh, when we go and uh, have the best repairs with our father tonight at St. Uh, Mark and St. Mary of Egypt. So... If you do have questions, you will get a chance to ask them just later on today during the Q&A. Uh, for now, we'll pray and we'll take a break and we'll go downstairs and we'll have lunch together. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me, surely. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a, ch like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Christ is risen from the dead by death, trampling down death and upon those in the tomb, bestowing life through intercessions of the Lady of Asal, the Theotoko, St. Mary, St. George, St. Anthony the Great. Lord, hear us when we pray thankfully, our Father. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. We'll meet everyone downstairs in the cafeteria. Tfadalu, habaybi. <laughs>